Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part four of my series on the selected gross pathology of the reproductive tract. We're going to talk about the non-pregnant uterus. We will eventually talk about the pregnant uterus. That's a separate lecture with a different group of diseases, and we're going to cover that somewhere farther on down the road in this series. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who have provided me images over the years, either directly or through online collections. Let's start with some developmental abnormalities of the uterus. Here's the uterus of a cow with a bit missing here at the top on the right-hand side. This is segmental aplasia, which is seen in cattle, occasionally in pigs, and rarely in other species. Remember that the tubular organs of the reproductive tract, including the anterior vagina, cervix, uterus, and oviduct, all arise from the paramesonephric duct. So any damage or delayed development of these ducts during development of the fetus is gonna cause abnormalities in these areas. There are a number of ways that this can manifest with segmental aplasia of the uterus being one of the more common. Other defects associated with paramesonephric duct difficulties would be a persistent hymen, or perhaps aplasia of the cervix. Segmental aplasia of these structures is best known in cattle in white shorthorns, where it's called white heifer disease. Here's a great picture from Sawang Kizdansa Kanwa at Chulalongkorn University which shows one of the more severe lesions associated with segmental aplasia, where the uterus only has one horn, and this over the years has been given the name uterus unicornis. Here's a nice little picture from Dr. Jay Kohler of Auburn University um, of serosal cysts along the surface of the uterus. This is an incidental finding, which you can see in dogs. It has to do with a pinching off of the surface epithelium. The, it heals over and fills with fluid, and you can see the uterus absolutely covered with these little cysts. They really don't mean much of anything. Another beautiful incidental finding in a goat from Dr. Kim Newkirk is melanosis. Remember that small ruminants have a lot of melanosis. You're going to see it just anywhere in the meninges, uh, in the peritoneum, wherever you can find uh, anything in a goat. And here it decided to affect the regress regressed caruncles within the uterus. Pretty, but of no moment. Okay. Now, one of the most common uterine lesions across animal species, which is often seen uh, in older animals, falls under Williams' rule of bubbles number one, which means that if you see bubbles on a gross presentation, especially if you're up close, I want you to think about cystic endometrial hyperplasia. And we're looking at the open lumen of the uterine horns of a dog, and you can see these large bubbles within the endometrium. Across animal species, there are lots of reasons for the development of cystic endometrial hyperplasia. The lesion could be either a diffuse lesion, as we see here, or it could be focal or segmental, especially in the dog and cat. So a couple of causes that you will see in rodents, especially in mice, old mice, female mice, they always have it, okay? So it's probably age-related. A lot of things have to do with the change as animals age in, uh, uh, in the ratio of progesterone to estrogen. And so as these ratios start to change, as the animal gets older, cystic endometrial hyperplasia may be a result, or certainly it's a contributing factor. You can see it as a result of irritation or low-grade endometritis, and bacterial infection is a form of irritation. I was taught years ago that uh, you 
have to have cystic endometrial hyperplasia before you develop pyometra in the dog and the cat. Um, over the years, that, that thought has changed that the low-grade bacterial infection that precedes pyometra is often responsible for cystic endometrial hyperplasia. The changes associated with cystic endometrial hyperplasia in the dog and cat usually are due or during a period of progesterone production after estrogen. And then this provides a good environment for bacteria to grow. So there is a connection between cystic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometra. But the bacteria are often present before development of the hyperplasia. Cystic endometrial hyperplasia has been reproduced by scarification of the uterine mucosa. And it's a change that was often seen with indwelling intrauterine birth control devices. Another time that I have seen commonly uh, cystic endometrial hyperplasia is in large zoo cats as a result of the use of depo uh, birth control, progesterone-like compounds, as you would expect. So you'll see it commonly, especially in older animals, and it's usually multifactorial in nature when it's grossly apparent. Here's another aggregate of bubbles. Even though we only see one horn in this uterus, whenever you see bubbles, I want you to think, could this be cystic endometrial hyperplasia? Here it is in the uterus of a rabbit, not uncommon. Aging rodents and lagomorphs will very commonly have it. That's not the worst thing that you can get if you're an aging female rabbit. We're going to talk about tumors of the uh, uterus in just a bit. Here it is in a pig. It's very common in older pigs, especially older pet pigs like Vietnamese pot belly pigs. Um, but it's also been seen in production animals as a result of contamination of the feed with estrogenic substances like xeralanone or subterranean clover. If there is obstruction of the uterine horn or cervix, or in this case, the vagina, you will often have an accumulation of fluid in the affected segments. This is a C57 black mouse, great picture by Donna Perry, which is available in Noah's archive. And you can see the structure here is an imperforate vagina, well known in this strain. And you can see fluid that has accumulated and filled the uterus, it's clear fluid. It actually has even filled the vagina. This is known as hydrometra. And it is a suggestion that there has been some form of obstruction somewhere in the tubular organs of the reproductive tract. Sometimes it can be a bit more turbid, as we see in this guinea pig, or we would call it mucometra. And the, then we're all fairly familiar with the pus-filled uterus, which is most often seen in the dog, less commonly in the cat and other species. And this is known by one word, pyometra. Now, if you want to call this a diffuse suppurative endometritis, that's great too. Pyometra is almost always an ascending infection. It occurs several weeks after estrus because the cervix was open. Okay? You can also see it happen postpartum because the cervix is open. Rarely you will see it in the pregnant animal, 
if the placenta is a target or the cervix is unfortunately patent during pregnancy. A low-grade bacterial infection in the dog will result in cystic endometrial hyperplasia and then when it overwhelms the local inflammatory response, it will progress to pyometra. Here's one that quite hasn't rolled out onto the table yet. You can see very characteristic brownish-red discoloration. If you smelled this, probably would smell pretty bad. And, and I will give you the insight of my friend John King, who's no longer with us, but saw probably more of these than anybody else had ever seen. And he said when he saw this foul-smelling reddish exudate, it was more likely to be a coliform, like E. coli or Proteus. And the ones that are associated with strep or staph typically are more thicker, creamier, whiter in nature, and didn't have that odor associated with it. If you cut this uh, particular uterus in, you're going to see uh, probably endometrial hyperplasia, necrosis and ulceration. The lining epithelium is going to be what we call progestational. It will be cuboidal to columnar and highly vacuolated because this animal is still under the effect of progesterone, which causes a very characteristic change in the endometrial lining. Progestational hormones also function to keep the uterus closed. So the majority of pyometras are closed pyometras. Here is a fantastic picture of pyometra in a mare by Paul Stromberg. Mares are a little different than dogs and cats, or a lot different than dogs and cats in development of pyometra, because hormonal variations aren't very important in mares as they are in the dog and cat, and many actually cycle through the infection, although I'm pretty sure this one is not going to be cycling all that well. You only rarely see systemic disease uh, and if you've ever seen a good pyometra in a dog, especially the closed ones, those animals are systemically ill. They're vomiting. They're running a high fever. And in the mares, as opposed to the dog, the cervix is often fully open. Now, it may be damaged. It might be scarred down or uh, adhered to other structures, otherwise impaired. But it's usually an open cervical situation. Bacteria that you will often see in the mares include uh, Strepzo, cause of agent of strangles, Corsi E. coli, um, Pasteurella pseudomonas, gram-negatives, and Actinomyces. And one of the old causes of this was a, a practice that has been largely discarded in most parts of the world, where uh, veterinarians would insert marbles into the uterus of mares for birth control. And remember, we said that you can incite local cystic endometrial hyperplasia, make the, uh, uh, the wall of the uterus sort of unfavorable for implantation by chronic irritation. That was the thought here, that uh, marbles would make the uh, uh, uterus resistant to uh, pregnancy and implantation. great picture by Raquel Reck from Texas A&M University of pyometra in a sow. Now, pyometra in a sow may be postpartum if the animal's trying to deliver in a, uh, a sort of filthy environment, but it can also be seen at the onset of estrus, a condition that's been uh, described over the years by profuse vaginal discharge, which is usually the result of infection by either E. coli or Staphyacus. It's thought that it's transmitted at mating or artificial insemination. Some sows will recover, some will never recover. And at autopsy, you see these copious amount of purulent material within the uterus. 
in laboratory rodents and rabbits. There are three common agents which will result in a suppurative endometritis or pyometra of the uterus. And this is the non-gravid uterus. In the mouse and rats, it's mycoplasma pulmonis. In the rabbit, it's pasturella multacida. In the guinea pig, it's bordetella bronchoseptica. The thing that sort of groups these three together, not only is this particular lesion, but all those bacteria in those species want nothing more out of life than to be a cilium. And so it attacks areas of the body. They all attack areas of the body which have a lot of cilia. The respiratory tract and the airways, the middle ear, and the reproductive tract. All of them have the ability to easily recruit neutrophils, resulting in lots of pus. Here's a classic picture from Dean Percy. You might recognize it from his book of these sort of cobblestoned, uh, uh, proliferative look and hemorrhagic look to the endometrium of the uterus of a rat with mycoplasma pulmonis infection. Remember, bacteria in the uterus is going to stimulate cystic endometrial hyperplasia, so you're going to see that change histologically. You're going to see cystic endometrial hyperplasia as a result of bacterial infection. Uh, dogs and cats pour out all the suppurative inflammation. You have that base of cystic endometrial hyperplasia with the superimposition of suppurative inflammation and bacteria. Okay, let's leave pyometra. Look at a couple of other uh, uh, neoplastic lesions of the uh, uterus and uh, neoplastic wannabe lesions of the uterus. This is a condition that is often seen in rabbits, especially older rabbits. And this is known as an endometrial venous aneurysm. It's a huge dilated uh, vein, or maybe in this case, sort of a, a venous plexus. It's considered to be a congenital problem, but doesn't show up usually until later in life in animals that have had a couple litters. And then the owner notices that as it hops around and sits down, it leaves a little bit of blood uh, behind. And this is a, a condition that can be easily treated at surgery. has just greatly dilated endometrial varicose veins. You can often see blood in the urine as well. It's not restricted to rabbits. You can occasionally see them in other rodent species, rarely in the domestic animals, but best known in the rabbit. This is from a rat. There's a large polyp. And endometrial stromal polyps are, are well known in the rat. But you can see polyps in the uterus filling the lumen, distending the lumen in just about any species. Now, they arise from two different cell types. Some are simply endometrial. Okay, It's a big polyp of endometrium attached to the underlying uterus by a small stalk. Sometimes it is a lot of uterine stroma that is just covered by a layer of endometrium. So in rats, endometrial stromal polyps are the rule. In other species like the dog, endometrial polyps are the rule. Here are a couple more endometrial stromal polyps. Okay, in non-human primates, we're looking at the body of the uterus here with a large polyp. Here's the cervix that has been opened up, and they're generally endometrial in non-human primates. They arise from the, uh, the basal endometrium, the endometrium deep in the glands, and as they are in non-human primates and other species, they're often responsive to estrogen, anything that makes the 
endometrium proliferate is going to make these polyps grow and they may wax and wane over time due to hormonal influences okay let's look at some tumors here is uh, the cervix the two horns of the uterus of a cow and one has been opened the wall is very very thick it is whitish and cattle get two different type of uterine neoplasms they get primary ones and metastatic ones and the metastatic ones or lymphoma are probably the more common about 30 percent of cattle with female cattle at least with uh, bovine leukemia virus infection will manifest with tumors within the urogenital tract and the uterus is a very common spot so uterine lymphoma is not uncommon in cattle at all and here's a case in a heifer from dr laura bryan from texas a and m probably less common usually you see them in more mature animals but uh, and this one might not have been the result of uh, bovine leukemia and you can see the other one was sort of a, a diffuse thickening this is sort of more of a nodular one but uterine tumors not uncommon in cattle the other one that you need to think about um, and cattle and rabbits are overrepresented is uterine adenocarcinoma it's the most common primary uterine neoplasm of cattle and at slaughter is usually seen as multiple uh, firm nodular masses within the uterus here's the cervix here the horns of the uterus and you can see multiple nodular uh, masses and it often will metastasize to the lungs great pictures from dr peg miller other than cattle and rabbits uterine adenocarcinoma is not a very common uh, neoplasm in most animal species but if you deal with rabbits especially the pet rabbits which tend to get a little older um, when these animals especially in the more exotic breeds like the, the tans and the french silvers and the dutch belters they get a little bit of age on them as we said before you have this sort of decreasing estrogen as, as most older females will experience uh, across animal species as they get older the, the ability to uh, produce estrogen decreases um, you get an imbalance in the uh, estrogen and progesterone which causes a lot of different diseases or causes diseases to manifest and this is one that happens in in uh, rabbits as they hit four to five years of age this uterine adenocarcinoma the tumors are often multicentric as we saw in the, in the cow they may be associated with cystic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometra as well and it's, here's a nice picture of one from Brian Caserto right here okay we have the tumor within the uterine horn we have a bit of hydromecia distal to it because we have an obstruction within the lumen normally there is fluid accumulation you know that the uterus is a very uh, labile uh, organ and the cycles of in, of, of you know estrogen progesterone it does re result in release of fluids it has to go somewhere if it can't you're going to get hydrometra and an, in uh, in the rabbit as well as in the the uh, cow you tend to have uh, a pulmonary metastasis very common in the rabbit a benign neoplasm that uh, happens in a number of animal species uh, especially in humans where they're called fibroids especially in goats is fibroliomyomas or lyomyomas of the uterine wall they can be just smooth muscle if they have a fibrous component we tend to call them fibroliomyomas um, 
they, in, in people at least, small ones cause no problems with fertility or whatever. Obviously, if you have a lesion that is this large, um, you're going to have fertility problems. But they are very common in a number of species, including non-human primates and humans. And uh, um, they look just like the surrounding smooth muscle, which might have a lot of fibrous connective tissue in it. Fibromyomas. Okay, so the base of the uterus is the cervix, and we're going to cover a couple of cervical lesions, and then we'll wrap it up for this particular lecture. Here's the cervix of a cow, which has been opened up, and you can see this hemorrhage. Um, you can often see hemorrhage if you are uh, slaughtering animals right after they have been uh, AI'd. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but uh, uh, iatrogenic damage and hemorrhage by passing the uh, AI pipettes probably a lot more common than uh, we think. And, you know, if you're seeing an animal right after something like that happens, maybe this, uh, this veterinarian got a little frustrated, poked it a little harder than he should or she should um, when passing the pipette. So it's a, it's a traumatic iatrogenic injury. Okay, here's a colposcopic picture of the cervix of a horse. It's an old picture of a disease that doesn't cause tremendous amounts of pathology. Remember, the cervix is an extension of the uterus. So anytime that you have uh, changes within the uterus, you have a chronic endometritis, uh, not uncommon in horses, or an acute endometritis, a uh, pyometra, whatever, you're going to have those changes are reflected in the cervix as well. And this particular cervix is edematous. It is somewhat congested. And that's because this animal is infected with Taylorella equigenitalia. It's a bacteria that causes a very mild uh, and temporary endometritis. We're going to look at it again when we see the lecture on the vagina because I got some great pictures there. Um, but just remember that the, uh, the state of the cervix often reflects what's going on within the uterus. Now, in cases of chronic endometritis um, or chronic cervicitis, you may, especially in cattle, have prolapse of the cervix. It just, you know, some of these older cattle with chronic infections or whatever, they will, the rings will protrude backwards into the vagina. They only rarely ever are seen externally, but you can uh, palpate the rings. And uh, if you look inside the vagina, you can see these prolapsed surgical rings. So prolapsed cervix, often the result of chronic uterine infections. Well, this cow has two cervices. Okay, and that happens. Normally you have one. Uh, in most species, you have one. Don't want to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the Australian marsupials. Their reproductive tract is crazy, and they often have two. Uh, possums, another marsupial, generally has two. This is known as uterus didelphus, and once again, it's a problem with that paramesonephric duct. Those ducts do a lot of things in the formation of these tubular structures. One of the things that they have to do is fuse, and it will result in one cervix. If they don't fuse, then you have two cervices, two openings, one per horn, and it's known as uterus didelphus. Okay, let's finish up with the disease of non-human primates, an animal model for a very important disease in humans. And we have here we have a large papilloma on the, uh, uh, on the cervix. Uh, in humans, papillomas are generally the result of infection with a wide variety of human papilloma viruses. And rhesus monkeys actually have a very similar uh, papillomavirus. Uh, rhesus papillomavirus type D is the most commonly isolated in association with genital infections with macaques. And this mirrors what occurs in people. The problem with the papilloma, 
besides being contagious, is that we well know the transition from papillomas to other forms of epithelial cancers, especially squamous cell carcinomas, uh, uh, affecting the, the genitalia of, of horses, and uh, HPV will often transform into uh, cervical carcinoma in uh, people and does the same thing in uh, non-human primates. It's an excellent animal model and these papillomas will ultimately turn into cervical carcinomas or adenocarcinomas. In people, the, these carcinomas generally arise at the interface of the squamous and the uh, columnar cells in the endocervix. Papillomas affect the genome in a number of ways by uh, inactivating the p53 and the retinoblastoma uh, pathways, inciting a cycle of preneoplastic to neoplastic lesions. Okay, well that covers the non-pregnant uterus and the cervix. In our next lecture, we are going to finish with the non-pregnant reproductive tract by looking at diseases of the vagina and vulva. And then after that, we're going to start on lesions of the uh, gravid reproductive tract. So we'll look at lesions of the, the uterus. We will look at lesions of the mammary glands. We will finish with a couple lectures on uh, lesions of the placenta and fetus. I hope that you will be hanging around for those. Uh, I thank you for hanging with me for a half hour this morning as we talked about the non-pregnant uterus. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again on the Foundation's Facebook page or YouTube channel. I hope everybody has a wonderful day.